Bismillah, elhamdülillah, ve salatu ve selamu Resulullah, ve ala alihi ve sabbihi ecmaîn, eşhedü la ilahe illallahu ve ahdü la şirikallah, ve eşhedü Muhammedin abdühü ve rasûlü mu'bâd. Ve selamu aleyküm ve rahmetullah. Yine elhamdülillah, Rabbil alemin, huve la di canlı muslimin. Oh, I bet you thought this was going to be in English. By the way, if you don't laugh at the jokes, they get worse. That's better. Elhamdülillah. I wanted to begin by mentioning that Allah subhanahu ta'ala revealed to us 1400 years ago a complete way of life. It's called the Deen al-Islam, the way of submission to God on His terms. And that's really what Islam means, to do what God wants you to do. We use the word Allah because there's no word in English to really describe the one only creator. They use the same word God, which is for anything worshipped, for God, the only one to be worshipped. Whereas in Arabic you have the advantage that when you want to make a distinction it's real easy. Ilah is what's ever worshipped. But Allah is clearly the only one to be worshipped. And this is the name that was always used by the Jews, the early Christians in the Aramaic language, and even by the Christians in the Arabic language today using the same word Allah. So these are some of the words that I'm going to be using in our talk. I'll be speaking to you about the Quran and just to clarify that for folks who maybe don't know a lot about it. The word Quran doesn't mean a book. Quran means a recitation, that which is being recited. It's oral. It's out loud. And it was learned by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, not from reading a book or from scrolls, but rather from actually hearing it from the angel Jibril. It's one of the miracles of the Quran is that it is a recitation. And it is not something that the Prophet ﷺ wrote down on a piece of paper and said, pass this on to the next generation. Instead, they memorized it mouth to ear and passed it on generation upon generation. Today, over 10 million people have totally memorized the Quran in the Arabic language. And it has no changes in it. There's no versions to it. There's just the Quran. There are many who are enemies to Islam who will go to great lengths to try to present a corrupted form of what I just told you, trying to take these things and twist them around to mean something else. But it's very easy for you to check these things out. And it's up to you to use your own brain and you can simply do so. The first thing I'll do is tell you the word Allah. I just mentioned to you that it's very clear that this is a word used in the Bible before there was the English language. The easiest way to check it out is to go to any hotel or any motel on the earth and go to the little drawer by the bed, open it up, and you're going to see a Bible. Open up that little Bible placed there by the Gideon Society, turn five pages, and it will tell you right there examples of the languages that they've translated this book into. One of them is the Afrikaans language, alphabetical order. And then the second one is Arabic. In the Arabic, you look at it in Arabic language, it uses the word Allah on about the fourth word. Alif Lam Lam Ha, it's right there. And by the way, just in case you wanted to know, the verse that they translated is out of the New Testament, John 3.16, for Allah so loved the world. So it, be sure you understand that if somebody comes and tells you something different, you can prove what the truth is. And remember that it's the Muslims who have the commitment to the truth. We cannot lie because we can go to hell forever. Other religions or beliefs or ideologies, maybe they don't have that problem, but we do. And that is something that we have to stick with. The truth is clear, and Allah said in the Quran, Ya yuladina amanu wa taqala wa kulu kaulin sadita. O you who believe, have taqwa for Allah. And we're going to be talking about that word taqwa in a minute. And always speak the truth. This is imperative. For us, it's not an option. The other reference that I made to you about the Quran itself, there are those who come along and try to tell you, oh, there's this version and that version. And actually this year when we were in Colorado, somebody stood up in the back of the room and said he was an Arab and he was uh, more uh, able to tell us about the Quran perhaps than yours truly. Because after all, he's an Arab and he mentioned what country he's from. Then he began to say that he's himself seen different versions of the Quran in the museum. And he mentioned in England. Well, of course, that's where he stepped in it pretty bad because I happen to know exactly what he was talking about. There are three, actually, Qurans that are very ancient. One is in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. One is in Istanbul in the Top Copy Museum. The other one is in England right now in the museum there. And all three of these are identical. 
He didn't mention that. He said they're different from what we have today. But he's right. They're very different from what we have today. But the words are exactly the same. The reason they're different is because Arabic has no vowels. There are no vowels in the Arabic language. There's no A, E, O, U like that. You don't have it. This is formed by understanding how to use the consonants. That's how you do it. But for the people who are not familiar with Arabic, somebody came along and decided, let's put in Tashkil markings to help the person understand it's not familiar with Arabic, so they'll say the right word. I'll give you an example. Saratul ladina and amta alayhum ghayrul magdubi alayhum waladalim. How many of you uh, think that that's wrong the way I said it? Raise your hand. It's wrong. Is it? But if you don't have vowel markings, you can't tell because alayhim and alayhum is exactly the same word. It's whether you put a kesra or whether you put the dumma over the ha. Alayhum or alayhim. It's the exact same word. And by the way, it has the same meaning either way. So it wouldn't really matter which one you say because it does carry the same meaning. But most of us, we say alayhim, yes? And it happens to be one of the different of the kirat or recitation of the Quran that are appropriate. So without going too deep into that, because that's not really our subject today, the Quran, we're talking about Ramadan. But I wanted to set the format for this thing so that when the future, especially when people listen to this and think about what we're talking about, they'll have some evidence and something you can check out for yourself. Those Qurans that I mentioned are different only in the way that the Tashkil is not there. It didn't exist. How could they have put it there when it didn't exist yet? And by the way, for your reference, you can also find this in any seminary school, that whenever you find out about the Old Testament, it was always in Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is very much like Arabic. They also have the problem with the consonants and the vowels. So they have substituted some of their letters to make vowel sounds, just as we have in Arabic language. But it wasn't until the ninth century that the Jews began to use this same idea. It's called Maserati text, because the Maseratis are the ones who copied the idea from the Quran and put it in theirs the same way. So be sure when somebody starts to tell you this and that and the other, be sure to know that there are places we can get clear evidence to prove what the truth really is. And basically that's what the message of Islam is about. It's about bringing truth with proof. Now let us talk about our subject today. Allah tells us in the Quran, Ya yulidina amanu, and he said, O oh, you who believe, kutiba alaykum asyam. It's been ordered for you. There. The best. Yeah. It's been ordered for you to fast. The month of Ramadan, which is cited by the Hilal, the crescent moon, when it starts, that's when the Muslims start fasting. It's estimated for us that that's going to be tomorrow night that they'll start reading the Quran. And when they do, that will signify the beginning of the month. Because the months on the lunar calendar start from sighting the moon, which means obviously it starts at night. The lunar calendars for the Jews and the Muslims always start the night is the first day. So as soon as the sun goes down, that begins the day. That's why even today the Jews who honor the Sabbath when the sun goes down on Friday night, that's when they start considering that their worship begins for the Sabbath. And it continues until the sun goes down again on Saturday night. And if you know anybody that's a Christian that follows the Seventh-day Adventist, they're the same way, using the same exact calendar and also following that with Saturday instead of Sunday. For us, the verse in the Quran is clear. The believers are ordered to begin fasting and then, then Allah says and it was ordered for the people before you as well men coveting who are the people before us and of course Allah refers to them throughout the Quran as the Ahl Kitab the Ahl Kitab means people of Ahl means people of such as Ahl Nar people of the fire Ahl Billah we don't want that Ahl Jannah people of the paradise and Ahl Kitab people of the book 
Again, that brings a clear distinction between the Muslim and those who are Christian and Jew. Because Allah doesn't call Muslims people of the book. The book is the Bible. The Bible is the Kitab al-Maqdas, which means the sacred book, holy book. And that's exactly when you translate it to English, holy Bible, Bible is Koine Greek, and it means book. Quran is different. It's recitation. The people of the book are closest to us, and Allah said that in the Quran, of all the other people on the earth. Closest to us are who? And Allah told you real clear. Even from them are those who have Iman. Allah said in chapter 3, Surah Al-Imran, verse 110, Kuntin khayra umatin now, most people think that that's where the ayah stops because they never really read it that close. But it continues. It continues, but I'm going to give you the translation first and then continue and let you hear the rest of it. You're the best of people raised up because you call to al-ma'ruf and you forbid al-munkar and you believe in Allah. And had the people of the book, see I'm continuing now, had the people of the book believed it would have been better for them and from them you will find those who have iman, faith. But most of them are Fasikun. Fasik means disobedient. doesn't mean kafir. It means disobedient. Because we could have, for instance, a sister who doesn't wear a hijab. She's still a Muslim. Absolutely. As long as she believes, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, she's a Muslim. But it's Fasik. Which means disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as that person wouldn't say, Oh, I don't believe you have to. Because suppose a, a sister wears hijab. But she says, it's not in the Quran. You don't really have to do it. I just like it because it's stylish. Okay? This is worse, according to Allah, than the one who doesn't wear the hijab. Because it's one thing that you disobey Allah, but it's something much worse that you lie against the law. It's much worse to corrupt the teaching of Islam. And for that, there's no, no excuse and no way to get out of the hellfire. So be careful of that subject. Okay, now, I want to come back to the verse that I was talking about because it continues and it's talking to us very clear about this idea of ordered to fast as the people before us were ordered to fast and then look what it says. Did, did you ever read it and understand? So that you'll get what? It tells you. Taqwa. And that's our word. Taqwa. I recall when Sheikh Ali Tamimi was once giving us the introduction to Ramadan that he broke down the first day, he broke it down and started with this word, the taqwa. And he explained to us, what is taqwa? How many of you know what's taqwa exactly? Anybody? You know what's taqwa? No? In the books, it always says piousness, piety, righteousness, yeah? So that you'll attain righteousness. But actually, in Arabic, it doesn't mean that. In Arabic, it means to put a petition up, to put a partition and I, I didn't just take Sheikh Ali's word for it. Although we love him very much, that's not what Islam teaches. It teaches us to get the knowledge to find out. So I did that when I was in various countries, various universities in Arabic, of course, and I asked them, does it mean that? They said, absolutely. That is the best meaning for this word, to put up hijab or a petition between you and something. And you think, well, wait a minute. How can I put a petition between me and Allah? Allah can see everything, hear everything, knows everything. I can't do that. And that's true. But it's to put a petition between you and the eminent punishment that's coming. Punishment is coming on the Day of Judgment. And this is the way you put something between you and that punishment. You put up a screen or a hijab between you and the ghadab of Allah. Let's take it from the Quran and see if that's correct. Look to what you're asking Allah in Surah Fatiha. All of us, we know, we begin by praising Allah, acknowledging that Allah is the only one we worship and the only one we turn to for help and guidance, yes? And then we say, Eh, dina, Surah Al-Mustaqim. Eh, di is the imperative of ordering somebody to do something. Do it. Eh, di means guide me. And if you say, Eh, di, na, guide us to the Surah Al-Mustaqim, the straight path. Then you're defining that path. You say, Surat al namta alayhim. That's the path of those that have the nama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nimit of Allah, which is his biggest favor. 
And then it says, and not the path, not the path of those who have the ghadab, ghadab of Allah. Maghdubi is ghadab. Not the path of those who have this anger, this punishment coming to them from Allah, while of Baalin or those who go astray, those that are lost. Because now, that's the end of the Fatihahs, yeah? Well, look what happens as soon as you keep reading. Keep reading. Alif Lam Mim. Three letters from the Arabic alphabet, yeah? And then it says, Now what does that mean? I'm sure somebody wants to tell me what's that. What does that mean? What does it mean? Go ahead. It's not Juma, you can talk, you know that. I bet this is the quietest you guys have been since you started school. Go ahead. What does it mean? This is the book that has no doubt. This is the book, huh? Uh, you speak Arabic? No. No? Okay. Who speaks Arabic? Somebody? It's your language. You speak Arabic? The word for this is what? Hada. Dalek means what? That. Dalek kitab al-Arabi means that is the book wherein there is no doubt. And if you read the tafsir, you'll be surprised to find that it's talking about the book Filaw Himma Fud with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The book that has no doubt is not the one you hold in your hand. It's the one that's with the law. And you're reciting from it. I want to make that distinction because a lot of people think that the Quran we hold in our hand is the Quran. It's not. It's not even really Quran. It's called Musaf. From the word Suhuf, which means scripture. Written scripture is not what Allah was talking about. He's talking about what's written with Him, which is in the preserved place in the heavens. In any case, then it goes on and it says, Daliko kitab Allah raybafi hudil it's a guidance for al-mutaqin, those who are mutaqi, mutaqi from taqwa. What is taqwa? And that's the subject for today. We understand now how important it is because you just ask a lot of guide you, right? You said it in Surah al king and he's telling you now what's guidance. Guidance is in that book with Allah. That's where it's at, and it's going to be a guidance, but only for who? Only for those who have a taqwa. And Allah is telling you here the conditions of the one who is going to have, get the taqwa. He has to believe in al-ghayb. He has to believe in the unseen. Do you believe in Allah? But you don't see Allah. You believe in the hellfire, but you never saw it. You believe in the after the resurrection, the day of judgment, yes. You believe in the paradise, yes. But none of these things have you seen. You believe in the jinn, they really exist, yes. Okay, this is al ghaib Do you believe in the angels? You don't see the angels. All of these things are a condition of belief. If you go to the end of the same chapter, which is Surah Baqarah, you'll find that the believers say, and we believe in Allah. Wa malayakatihi wa kutubihi wa rasuli. La nufaraka bayna al-hadim wa rasuli. Allah tells you in the Quran that the believers say we believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His prophets, making no distinction between those prophets. All of this is a condition of belief, and it's all talking about this when you say that you believe in al ghaib And then another condition that you have to establish the Salah, you must establish worship. Because without establishing the worship, you haven't really done anything. As in Texas we say, put your money where your mouth is, that's it. That's your chance to do what you say. You said, I'm a Muslim. La ilaha illallah. Okay, great. Now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to worship Allah? Are you going to establish the Salah? Are you going to pray five times a day? Huh? Or four? Or three? Or when you get around to it? Huh? I was thinking to have some little wooden coins made up that said round to it and then every time somebody said when I get around to it I'd say well now you got a round to it and never mind <laughs> but think about this for a minute Allah is telling you conditions here on how to be guided if if you don't want to be guided you don't need to be a Muslim just go make your own way just make out something that's what most people do anyway most people do that even if you say well he's a Christian but you'd be surprised in the Christian church, how many people have different opinions of so many different things, yet they all sit together, sing the same songs and pray and everything, 
Well, they don't believe the same thing. Even some of the preachers have told me, I believe this, but the church believes that, and I believe this, but the church believes that. I'm like, what? In Islam, that's not an option. The beliefs are clear. It's spelled out for you. I just read some of them to you. Then the conditions for action are very clear as well. Right in the beginning of the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, to establish the Salah, it's right there, establishing the Salah, the worship. Believing in the unseen and establishing the worship. The belief has to come first because you don't know who you're worshiping otherwise. But then immediately, the Salah. And then to give the charity. That's also there. We have to. Mimma rizqnahum, spending from what Allah has given them, the rizq. And they believe, listen to this, and they believe in what's being sent to you, O Muhammad. That means it's a condition of belief for the Muslim to believe in the Quran coming from Allah. And they believe in what was sent down before. This means no Muslim should ever engage in a debate about is the Bible the Word of God unless you want to take the position to say, yes, it is. We can prove the Bible is the Word of God real easy. <laughs> How? All i got to do is prove to you the Quran is correct, show you the miracles of the Quran, the scientific miracles, the predictions and prophecies of the Quran, show you the miracle of the language of the Quran, any of these things until you understand the Quran could not be from a human being, especially 1400 years ago, especially living in a desert. It's from Allah, and once you believe that, then read the Quran, it tells you the Bible also came from Allah. That's the best proof there is. Now, pay attention. We didn't say the Quran in English. Allah said it's a Quran only in Arabic. Read it. It's a recitation in the language of Arabia. Yes or no? Absolutely. So if you translate it, Yusuf Ali, Marmaduke, Pikthal, Halali, and Khan, whatever, if you translate it to English, is it still the Quran? <laughs> no. In fact, that's the problem. A lot of people, these journalists and so on today, they start quoting the Quran. Only they're not really. They're quoting an English translation. And they will go through 15, 16, 17 different translations till they find a word that they're looking for. Aha! Right there. See, it says in the Quran, right there. It doesn't say in the Quran. Quran is recitation. We even said, I'm, I'm in the beginning of the speech, I disqualified that statement, didn't I? It's not a book. And it's in English. Hello? So likewise, we're going to say the same thing about the Bible. Unless you've got the original, if you've got Moses' signature somewhere, bring it. If you can show us something, we can get, at least do a carbon dating and, and prove that Jesus or somebody at, at his time wrote it, at least then we'll look at it. But in the meantime, when you're coming up with translations in Latin, Kone Greek, and you're calling that's the Bible? Oh, well, the scholars themselves said that's not the Bible. But it represents the Bible to them. What represents the Quran to us is much more clear, though, because there's only one. Hmm. So, I'm off on that subject again and again, because even in Ramadan, you, you're going to focus on the Quran, because that's one of the first things that happens. Tomorrow night, by the way, if you go to the masjid, they should be starting the recitation of the Quran right after Salat al Shah, is that right? Yeah. So, we'll look forward to that. Now, let's talk about this taqwa a little bit more. Taqwa is needed to be guided. And one of the ways to get taqwa is to do what Allah said, believe in al-ghaib, establish salah, pay the charity, believe in the Quran, which means to recite it and, you know, spend some time with the Quran every day. And believe what came before. Don't go out here challenging Christians all the time on their boat. If they say, well, this said that and this said that, they're talking in English. They're not talking from the real Bible. Just smile and let them have a nice day. It's up to a lot to guide the people. Don't worry about that. Are you really worried? Do you really think you're going to guide somebody? Huh? Have you looked in the mirror lately? If anybody needs guidance, it's us. What are we out here talking about? We're going to guide these other people. And Allah said it clearly in the Quran. You do not guide who you love. It is Allah who guides whomever He wills. And he gives this guidance to those whom he knows has a good heart and that they will try. He doesn't guide those who don't want to be guided. you got people standing up in front of the minbar, even giving lectures. They're not guided. I just recently heard one, a sister, who said that the Pope was more like Muslims than we are. I didn't think that was on guidance. I really didn't. 
But yet she's got the command to get out here on the international television and speak. Huh? One of her platforms that she talks about is that, you know, women should be given khutbas and things like this. But this is not guidance. This isn't guidance. Because anybody who wants to get up in front of people and wants to go out here to promote something, this is not guidance. Myself standing here right now, if I wanted to come here for some purpose other than to share the deen of Islam, that wouldn't be guidance. If you need to be in front of a microphone to get people's attention, this is a personal problem that you've got. It's serious. It's a very serious problem because shaitan can come to you real easy that way. But to have real taqwa is to fear Allah so much that the reason you come to the stage and the reason you speak is because you're afraid of Allah if you don't do it. You're more afraid of Allah than you are of the people ridiculing you or making fun of you. Think about it for a minute. What would it be like if you had to stand up in front of 10,000 people and several television cameras and start speaking right now? Would it be hard for you? It's hard for me. Yet, I am more afraid of Allah. So when I go out there, that's where I put the trust first in Allah. And I say, Bismillah, just like I did tonight when I came to you. I start with that, and then we'll see what happens. This fear of Allah, that's the subject that we're talking about, is something that has to be a part of your daily life. Before you even start talking about fasting, it should be that every day you're thinking about Allah. When you do anything, do you worry what Allah is going to say or do you worry what the people are going to say? How are you going to dress today? What will you wear today? So you get up in the morning you look, what will make me attractive to the girls? Huh? Or, I won't say it that way, what I'll say is, what will make me look the most presentable? To whom? And how will I look when I go out? Will I put makeup on? How will I fix my hair? Will I? And if I'm doing that for the people, then this means what? I'm not doing it for Allah. So this taqwa is everything. And it should be something that is with you all the time. It could be stronger and weaker at different times. Yeah, but that, that, that's normal because your mind is not going to always be focused on the same thing all the time. But when you can turn it on and off like a switch, this is a problem. This is a big problem. That's, this is called hypocrisy, actually, that you can turn it on and be very righteous. Brother, you should be very nice to your mother and say kind things. And then go home to your own and say, shut up, you old bat. <laughs> this is turning it on and off. And it's not acceptable to Allah. And the only one you're fooling is yourself. Everybody can see through you, by the way. Just because people don't tell you something doesn't mean they don't know. You want me to prove that one to you? That's easy to prove. How many times has somebody told you toward the end of the day you had bad breath? And then you wonder how many other people you talked to who didn't tell you. The only one you're mad at is the one that told you, though. And that's some The only friend you got, you're mad at them. They told you, by the way, brother, <laughs> get some tips. Hmm? Okay, let's press forward on the subject. Now, we've been talking about Tukwa. And there are other things Allah mentions in the from get Taqwa. He talks about the Salah, and there's ayahs about that also in Baqarah. There are many things that Allah is telling you about Taqwa. But then remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also calls on you as a believer, not just a Muslim, but as a believer, and then throws that at you afterwards. Ya ayyu ladina amanu wa taqwa Allah. Oh, you who believe have Taqwa for Allah. Put that petition up between you and his punishment, the inevitable which is coming. Wakulu kaulin sagida. Ya yuladina amanu udukulu fisume kafatan. That's also in Bakra, chapter 2, verse 208. All you who believe enter into Islam perfectly. And now look what Allah says here. And don't follow the footsteps of Shaitan. Verily, he is an avowed open enemy to you. There is a real enemy. The worst enemy you got is Iblis, Lucifer, the devil. And this guy's active, really active. I'll tell you a little, quick little story about that. When I was a Christian preacher, we had a joke about the devil. And this one lady, she was always very righteous, okay? She'd never say anything bad about anybody. So two little boys, they decided they're going to try to trick her up, you know? 
and get her to say something bad about somebody. They tried everything. But she'd always say, well, you know, maybe they didn't know. Maybe they... They're always trying to find the good of anything. So when the lady's leaving, she was saying goodbye to the preacher and going home. Just when she was right in front of the preacher, the two little boys ran up to her and they said, Miss Jones, what do you say about the devil? Ah, right in front of the preacher. What could she possibly say? Without even thinking for a minute, she said, well, he is energetic. <laughs> That's true. Got a lot of energy. 